Good afternoon. You are tuned into the Labor Forum here at WRFG 89.3 FM in Atlanta. Um, my name is Diane Mathewitz. I'm a retired auto worker, co-host and producer of the program. Seated next to me in the studio is Paul McLennan, ATU Local 732, retired MARTA worker. Hey, Paul. Hi, Diane. So, it's so wonderful to have a beautiful, sunshiny day here in Atlanta. I want to welcome all of you who are listening on your radio at 89.3 FM and those of you who are uh, listening to the program on your computers at wrfg.org. There might be some of you who are listening on a mobile device. We do have an app, um, so it means you can really listen to any of the WRFG programs anywhere in the world. And of course, uh, there may be a few of you who are tuned in and watching us live as we broadcast the program here on the Labor Forum YouTube channel where you are always able to uh, watch it at, at the moment it's happening, but also we archive the programs, both our audio and visual, and uh, so you always can catch up to the program if you're driving now and you want to see. So uh, we have a good show, as always, here on the program today. I want to also remind you all that our Fall Pledge Drive starts in just uh, a week. Uh, it'll start at midnight on uh, Monday, the 19th of October, beginning with uh, the overnight program, Sunday night into Monday morning, and that uh, it'll extend until November 8th. As a listener-supported and sponsored radio station, at community radio station, we rely on you, our listeners, to help uh, financially support this station. Um, as many of you know, unless uh, you uh, have, as many of you know, we are uh, all volunteers here at WRFG, and uh, so all the programs are done by people who love what it is that we are doing. Um, but those that play the music are all experts in the music. Those of us who do the public affairs programs are actively engaged in the issues about which we talk. So again, you are tuned into WRFG 89.3 FM in Atlanta. So the views that are expressed on this program may not necessarily be those of the board of directors, staff, or volunteers here at WRFG. We're going to go ahead and start with our labor headlines and move right into um, this week in labor history. And then we have guests who are both going to be in the studio and calling in. So we hope you stay tuned for the next hour. And, um, it's just some of the information about working people that is often hard to find if you just listen to commercial radio and read big business newspapers. So here are the headlines for Monday, October 12, 2015. The Labor Forum joins with the many other unions and worker organizations that have extended solidarity and condolences to the people of Turkey who experienced a vicious terrorist attack on Saturday, October 10th. Four major Turkish unions and professional associations, and it was the public sector uh, union in Turkey that was one of the main organizers, along with progressive civil society organizations, Kurdish and leftist parties, had mobilized tens of thousands for a labor, peace, and democracy rally in the capital city of Ankara. The repressive ruling party, named uh, kind of ironically, Justice and Development Party, or by its initials, AKP, has a program of restricting democratic rights, attacking unions and workers' living conditions, and advancing capitalist interests. In particular, it has been aggressive in repressing any movement among the Kurdish population. The AKP lost its majority control of the Turkish parliament in June, and new elections are set to take place November 1st. The Ankara rally was an effort to push back against the renewed military campaign against the Kurds and to advance resistance to government austerity and corruption. The two bomb blasts that killed at least 128 people as of last night with many hundreds more injured from among the crowd of public sector workers, youth, labor leaders, and Kurdish activists. 
Reports from the scene tell of a fully equipped riot police squad with a water can in, arriving before the ambulances, and of, peer, of police tear gassing the protesters as they attempted to aid the injured or to leave the area. The Aragon government has repeatedly called its opponents terrorists and other demonizing terms in an attempt to mobilize an ultra-nationalist right-wing turnout in the upcoming election. The U.S. has backed Erdogan in his repressive policies and has secured the use of Turkish air bases for bombing missions in Syria, supposedly against ISIS. At the same time, Turkey has conducted numerous air assaults on Kurdish camps in Syria and Iraq, the very fighters widely known to be the most successful against ISIS. A two-day general strike has been called for today and tomorrow by the progressive unions to protest state violence and to allow for people to attend the funerals of their family members and colleagues. On Sunday, tens of thousands marched in cities across Turkey, including Istanbul, Ankara, and in the Kurdish areas. And I saw just before I came here that there were again thousands marching in the funeral processions today all chanting against the government, calling it a murderer and a thief. On October 8th here in the United States, the U.S. Department of Labor asked a federal judge to block Lear Corporation's defamation lawsuit against Kim. Kim, Kim uh, for those of you who have listened many times, has uh, been on this program uh, several times. She worked at the Selma, Alabama plant that produces seats for the Hyundai assembly operation in Montgomery. King and other workers claim the chemicals used in the foam, as well as poor ventilation and lack of protective gear, were making them sick. Lear's subsidiary, it's called Renosol Seating, fired King for bringing the issue to Hyundai's attention and then later sued her for defamation. In May, a federal judge ruled that Lear had to cease and desist from any retaliatory action against King and her fellow workers. But just recently, in the end of September, an Alabama circuit court judge ruled on a technicality in favor of Lear, allowing them to again pursue the defamation lawsuit. Workers at the Selma plant who earn 9 to $12 an hour are just some of the many low-wage workers who produce billions in profits for auto companies. The Labor Forum stands with Kim King. And congratulations are in order for the residents of Peoplestown who successfully pushed back an attempt by the city of Atlanta to take the home of 93-year-old Maddie Jackson. In a much publicized meeting with Mayor Kasim Reed, he stated that her home was safe from a Department of Watershed plan to demolish all the houses in a two-block section of the historic black neighborhood. What is to become of the other homes occupied by families refusing to sell out is still unclear. But this truth is clear, that when we fight, we win. And those are our labor headlines for today, and we'll move right away into our This Week in Labor History. Hi, Paul. Thanks, Diane. Um, traditionally today, October 12th, is recognized as Columbus Day and celebrated as a national holiday. It marks the anniversary of the arrival of Columbus in the Americas, which happened on October 12, 1492. Columbus Day first became an official state holiday in Colorado in 1906 and became a federal holiday in the United States in 1937. Rather than celebrate Columbus, there is a growing movement to abandon this holiday and come to terms with the real history and crimes of settler colonialism. Columbus initiated the transatlantic slave trade in early February 1494, first sending several dozen enslaved Taino, Tainos to Spain. Tainos were members of the indigenous Arawak people whose culture was destroyed by genocide, epidemics, and assimilation under Spanish colonization. Columbus recommended to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella that taxing slave shipments could help pay for supplies needed in the Indies. Taino slavery in Spain turned out to be unprofitable, but Columbus later wrote, Let us in the name of the Holy Trinity 
go on sending all the slaves that can be sold. Columbus is also responsible for initiating the African slave trade to the Americas. The first license granted to send enslaved Africans to the Caribbean was issued by the king and queen in 1501 during Columbus's rule in the Indies. From the very beginning, Columbus was not on a mission of discovery, but of conquest and exploitation. Columbus deserves to be remembered as the first terrorist in the Americas. When resistance mounted to the Spaniards' violence, Columbus sent an armed force to spread terror among the Indians to show them how strong and powerful the Christians were, according to the Spanish priest Bartolome de las, de las Casas. The curriculum editor of Rethinking Schools magazine, Bill Bigelow, said recently that if indigenous people's lives mattered in our society, and if black people's lives mattered in our society, it would be inconceivable that we would honor the father of the slave trade with a national holiday. Too often, even in 2015, Bigelow says, the Columbus story is still young children's first curricular introduction to the meeting of different ethnicities, different cultures, different nationalities. They're taught that white people have the right to rule over peoples of color, that stronger nations can bully weaker nations, and the only voices they need to listen to throughout history are those of powerful white guys like Columbus. Is this said explicitly? No, it doesn't have to be. It's the silences that speak. In 1977, the International Indian Treaty Council called for the end of the celebration of Columbus Day to declare instead the International Day of Solidarity and Mourning with Indigenous Peoples. The UN Committee on Racism, Racial Discrimination, Apartheid, and Colonialism passed the resolution with the support of many organizations such as the African National Congress and the Palestine Liberation Organization who recognized the devastating effects of colonialism. The United States is a settler colonial state premised on the genocide of indigenous peoples. Ongoing persecution subjects natives to the highest forms of violence from birth to death. They are disproportionately sub subject to state persecution, sexual violence, discrimination, social exclusion, poverty, and homelessness. Native children experience post-traumatic stress disorder at the same rate as veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, a recent Senate report concluded. One report found Native children three times more likely to be held in juvenile detention and two times more likely to be transferred to adult prison. There is a nationwide movement to replace Columbus Day with an honoring instead of Ind Indigenous Peoples Day. Last week, the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico, which has the highest concentration of indigenous people in the state, joined other cities such as Seattle, Minneapolis, and Portland in declaring the second Monday of October as Indigenous Peoples Day. It is time to get rid of Columbus Day and instead commemorate the contributions in history as well as the continued resistance and resilience of indigenous peoples throughout the Americas. Thank you so much, Paul. And uh, listeners, I am from Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I have to say <laughs> that it makes me very happy that uh, today in the schools in uh, the city where I was brought up, uh, they're actually learning not so much about Columbus sailed the ocean blue, <laughs> but really about uh, who was here and the contributions that the uh, indigenous people of the Americas uh, have made to global humanity. So we're going to take uh, just a short break and have a, a message from WRFG, and then our, we are joined in the studio by Eunice Choi. Hi, Eunice. Thank you so much for coming in again. And we're going to have an important discussion about really an immigration issue uh, that is um, important for all people here in uh, Metro Atlanta to know about with the Fulton County Commission. So please stay tuned. So, do you want to hear? 
Do we play both of them or just one? Joe. Yes. Both or just one? I have one more. What's the other one? Um, go fund me. It's a long one. No, it's this one. This is close enough to her? Yeah, feel free to move it up closer for you. So sorry. We're going in? <laughs> We're back with our guest, uh, Paul McLennan, uh, who is a member of the Not One More Coalition. Uh, we'll go ahead and introduce Eunice. Um, Eunice, thank you for coming in today. Um, can you start by explaining what the most recent development has been? Um, I think the last time you were on, we were talking about the detainers um, in the issue with different counties holding people illegally uh, for deportation. And now we've had a new development. Sure. Well, thanks for having me here today. I'm Eunice Cho. I'm with the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I'm actually part of the Georgia Not One More Coalition that you mentioned, Paul. Um, the latest development here is actually last Wednesday, yeah, over 50 community members participated in the Fulton oh. County Commissioner's meeting to voice their opposition to a proposed memorandum of understanding to place federal immigration agents in the county's jails. And we actually found out the details of this proposed agreement only after we filed an Open Records Act request for the county. So none of these details were public, and we didn't actually know what was in them. Um, when we did uh, read through the proposed memorandum of understanding that we got after uh, we filed this Open Records Act request with the county, we discovered uh, something that looks a lot like an attempt by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE for short, to basically make an end run around its own enforcement guidelines. And it's a very dangerous proposal, and that's why so many folks turned out to uh, show their opposition to this at the Fulton County Commissioner's meeting. Can you say more about how it's a step backwards from the progress that had been made? Absolutely. So last year, uh, actually around this time last year, uh, the Georgia Not One More Coalition, together with uh, Fulton County Commissioners, who unanimously passed a resolution saying that uh, Fulton County was uh, did not want to hold um, individuals in their custody on what's called an ICE hold or an ICE detainer. And basically what that meant was that if somebody came into the custody of the Fulton County Jail um, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement put out this thing called a hold, asking uh, the Sheriff's Office to hold somebody for Immigration and Customs Enforcement to pick them up, um, it, it, Fulton County basically said that we're not going to do that because there's a huge host of issues including legal liability for constitutional violations um, because of the threat to public safety that that really posed because of the growing mistrust that uh, happened as a result in terms of immigrant communities not really feeling safe with law enforcement in Fulton County as well as just we know what happens in terms of uh, the rampant uh, racial profiling that happens and you know the effect of those policies that we had seen over the past five years was in the state of Georgia 40,000 U.S. citizen children lost their parents to deportation because of these types of policies. And so I think Fulton County really recognized uh, the danger of having these types of, uh, of, of policies in place. Luckily, uh, the Fulton County Sheriff agreed and uh, rescinded and said, we are not going to honor these ice holes any longer. However, you know, this came on a wave of national opposition to these types of policies by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And uh, over 250 jurisdictions around the country, like Fulton County, said, we are not going to do this. And so what happened in November 2015 last year, a few months after Fulton County passed this resolution, um, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Department of Homeland Security rolled out a new program called the Priority Enforcement Program, PEP for short. And none of us really knew what was in uh, this agreement. And uh, we did see some uh, official statements by the uh, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security saying, actually, PEP is going to be a much limited program where we only prioritize certain folks with um, severe criminal histories uh, to be um, placed into ICE custody. And we're going to only prioritize those individuals. Um, but what we didn't really know was what was actually going on in terms of how ICE was actually implementing this around the country. And so we had been meeting with um, ICE officials here locally, and none of them ever said a word about um, placing ICE agents in, in county jails. And the 
you know, we hope that this is an anomaly, that this is something that is something that uh, local ICE officials have done without really recognizing that this is in violation of what, uh, you know, nationally the policy is supposed to be. And I think the problem with it is that we really only found out about this after uh, hearing rumors about this on a news report and then filing an Open Records Act request. So, uh, you know, if I can ask a question. So one of the, you know, this is a program that talks about the issues that are uh, important to workers. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that, that uh, always gets um, misstated or, or, or used uh, in a pejorative sense is that it's never explained who the folks are who are being deported. Mm -hmm. It's always presented as though they're these dangerous criminals uh, and somehow that, the, that the, uh, their presence in the communities is uh, creating safety issues for other people. Can you talk at all about who it is and how it is that people get picked up? It is not, in fact, the way I understand it, the vast majority of people that are being held for deportation are people who work, for one, have as you mentioned, citizen children, and who get picked up for uh, failure to signal or not going through a, a or going through a light or speeding or I don't know a variety of things. Could you talk about that in a more uh, precise form? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think what uh, the thing that we are actually very worried about with this particular agreement um, is that the language of the agreement is so broad that it allows us to track any foreign national who could pose a potential safety threat, um, a threat to public safety, which really, that language could mean anything. Um, we know that the failure to turn on your turn signal could pose a, a, a threat to public safety if you read it that broadly. So we do know that this uh, type of policy really has the danger of casting a very wide net in terms of who actually gets caught up in, uh, in terms of uh, people who are then brought into uh, Fulton County in custody and then who then are you know, available for tracking by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And I think that really does uh, pose a very large danger uh, to all of our communities. One thing that I know that immigrant, immigrant rights activists and advocates have been saying uh, throughout this fight is that uh, not only are immigrant communities uh, directly impacted and also impacts broader community safety because uh, once folks are afraid to trust local law enforcement, then uh, that really uh, that really threatens everybody's public safety. So um, could you say a little more about the coalition, the Georgia Not One More Not Coalition, and what it, the kind of work it does? Yeah. Well, Paul is also a member of Georgia Not One More, but sorry, the Georgia Not One More Deportation Coalition is a really great coalition of uh, advocates, organizers, activists, folks here uh, okay. throughout okay. Georgia who are working to um, to make sure that our communities are safe, that um, that immigrant communities have the right to stay and to protect um, everyone here in our communities. And it includes folks from the labor movement, includes folks from uh, the immigration and immigrant community, religious groups, um, uh, LGBT organizations, civil rights organizations, and it's just a really wonderful and very powerful coalition. I wanted to still follow up again about who is making money off of uh, these policies. And I, I think that uh, many people who listen to this program know that we have talked about the Stewart Detention Center in particular, but that is not the only for-profit detention center in Georgia. And I think people would be shocked to know the number of private prisons that have been set up specifically to detain and hold working uh, people um, until they get deported. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about, a little bit about the, these corporations that are reaping billions of dollars? Absolutely. Well, we know that um, actually 60% of uh, immigrant detention centers in the country are run by private prison companies. Uh, we know that uh, private prison companies like uh, CCA and the GEO group um, actually have had a very strong uh, lobbying presence mm -hmm. in Congress and have actually been very uh, mm -hmm. directly involved in trying to uh, pass more punitive immigration policies, knowing full well that they mm -hmm. will benefit, uh, their bottom line will benefit as a result of this increased enforcement against immigrant communities. 
As he mentioned, there are uh, many de immigrant detention centers here in Georgia. Uh, Stewart uh, Immigration Detention Center uh, in Lumpkin, Georgia is one of the largest facilities in the country. It holds 1,600 people uh, per day and um, is, is one of the is one of the largest facilities not only here in the South but throughout the country. Uh, we were actually there um, a few weeks ago with the delegation of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and it's always, uh, you know, of concern to see uh, what is actually happening there mm -hmm. in the detention centers. Uh, there's actually a lot of organizing around um, the detention centers here in the South. Um, uh, later in November, there will be a, mm -hmm. a march and a rally uh, to shut down Stewart. There's other types of activities, not only in Georgia, but throughout the South. There's similar um, uh, you know, types of activities around uh, detention centers, such as Etowah County Detention Center in, um, in, in, in Gadsden, Alabama. Yes. So, so how this all leads into everything is that, that in order to get those federal dollars to put the people in these for-profit prisons, they first have to come through a city or a county jail where ICE mm -hmm. is waiting, essentially, <laughs> to, uh, to send them to where they will sit for perhaps months, and I've heard some people for years uh, waiting for, for some sort of adjudication. That's right. Um, I think that's one issue that definitely comes up in immigration detention centers is, uh, for some people, uh, can have very lengthy stays in detention, often without any end. Unlike prison, where you know when what your sentence <laughs> is and when you're going to get released. If if so, uh, with immigration detention, it can actually seem very in, in, indefinite in terms of you don't know uh, when your case is going to get resolved. Uh, the immigration court system is plagued by many backlogs in terms of not enough judges, um, lack of access to counsel. These are all issues that make actually trying to bring your case forward uh, and defend yourself in immigration court very difficult. And from detention, it becomes even more difficult. And so, you know, we have worked with individuals who have been detained for over eight or nine years trying to fight their case and ultimately are released because they prevail on their claims. But it takes quite a long time. And actually, the cost to taxpayers is in enormous uh, in terms of just the, uh, at each facility, um, some facilities here in the South are paid anywhere from 50 to $120 a day for each individual that's housed in detention. So, uh, Eunice, thanks so much. You, uh, we're almost out of time. If you want to give some information about how people could get connected. Yes, well, the thank Georgia you detention so much. Yes, um, the Georgia Not One More Detention Coalition is uh, still ramping up its activities. So, um, for folks who are, um, you know, living here in Fulton County who want to voice their opposition and really show that uh, we are worried about everyone in our community, we don't want this uh, agreement to be signed between uh, the Fulton County Commissioners and Immigration and Customs Enforcement. We really urge everyone to get in touch and let them and let uh, both Fulton County and um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement know that this is not something that can happen in our community. And for more information about the Southern Poverty Law Center? Um, for more information about the Southern Poverty Law Center, where I'm a staff attorney, um, go to www.splcenter.org. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. We appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we'll take uh, a few minutes for one more message from WRG, and then our guests are on the phone from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, we're going to hear about the bus driver struggle in with local uh, eight. ATU, that's the Made Transit Workers Union, 998 in Milwaukee. Stay tuned.